Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, we're talking to one of radio equipment's amazing innovators. And I mean that sincerely. It's Mike Dosh with Angry Audio. Yes, I know Mike's an advertiser on this show, but let's take a listen to some of his ideas on audio processing, a new little audio mixer that he's uh, making. And we're going to hear from Chris Tarr, too, from Racine, Wisconsin, at the scene of a transmitter difficulty. It's coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio. Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel, worry-free transmission you can count on with outstanding control, reliability, efficiencies, and Nautel's unmatched 24-7 customer support online at Nautel.com. And by MaxConnect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from uh, the microphone to that light bulb at the top of the tower. Howdy, I'm Kirk Harnack, so glad to be here with you here today. It's a beautiful day in Nashville, Tennessee. Sun, clouds, just beautiful temperatures. It's a it's a good spring day. And I'm I'm just I'm glad to be alive and happy to be uh, uh, able to talk to you, um, have you listen up and take a look at, at uh, what our guests have to say and, and have to show. So I'm in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee, and I understand that Chris Tarr will be coming along. I'm going to vamp a little bit until I know that Chris is ready. So let me just go ahead and introduce our guest. Oh, he's right here. Hey, hey, Chris. Welcome in. Hey there. Hey, good to see you, man. What's up? Good to see you. I'm, uh, I can go into the story after your introductions on what I'm doing. I'm a little busy today. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll we'll introduce our, our guest and then, uh, We'll jump back in with you in a couple minutes. Uh, so I'm, uh, you know, there's always last minute changes, right? That's the nature of show business. Um, our guest was scheduled to be a really interesting fella named Thane Conrock. What a name, Thane Conrock. And I got to tell you, dude looks the part. <laughs> he looks like a Thane Conrock. I wouldn't want to meet up with him in a dark alley, man. He'd take you out. Uh, Thane is a radio station owner from Oklahoma, and he's doing a lot of high tech things, running his stations very effectively and efficiently. But the lightning last night was more efficient and effective in uh, Oklahoma, and it took out a little bit of his equipment. So Thane had to go fix some gear. He'll be back to join us on a future show. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. In the meantime, I've been meet, been trying to get this guy, our, our substitute guest, uh, to be on the show anyway. So I called him up and said, hey, Mr. Catfish, could you possibly change the date and you know, come and talk about some technology things uh, sooner? And he said, mm, okay. <laughs> so here he is. It's uh, my friend and yours, um, Mike Dosh. Mike, welcome in. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me at the last minute, Kirk. I, uh, it I, was I last hope minute. I'm not a disappointing substitute guest. I'll do my best. Well, I know I took I took you away from what sipping on on iced tea and lemonade. Uh, w- you know, yeah. while you watched your family mow the lawn, probably. Yes, exactly right. How did you know? <laughs> oh, you live up the street. That's how you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. well, it, it's good to see you now. Uh, people may know you as the uh, proprietor, the owner, the founder of Angry Audio, and you're one of our sponsors. So, you know, before people think that I'm just entirely shilling for Angry Audio, yeah, I am. But also, uh, yeah. Catfish and I have known each other since 20, no, since 2000. Well, I met you in uh, in April of, of the year 2000, right after Y2K. Remember that? Okay. No, I don't remember Y2K. <laughs> <laughs> I try to, try to forget these things. Yeah. Big nothing burger. We met at an NAB show. Uh, you and, and Marty Sachs uh, looked me over and said, do we have to stoop this low and maybe hire this guy? And, and I think you guys had a discussion about it. And somebody said, yeah, let's give him a try. So here we are. It wasn't anything like that, Kirk. We were uh, we were very privileged that you were willing to join the team. And obviously, you're still with Telos. It's decades later. And so, you know, that was a, apparently a pretty good hire. Well, well, thank you. I, I, I really enjoy working uh, with Telos. They are an amazing, amazing group of people, and I, I, I love they them are. dearly. Speaking of someone we love dearly, he's just joined us from, I guess, a transmitter site in Racine, Wisconsin, I'm guessing. Chris Tarr. Hey, welcome in, Chris. Hey there. Actually, I'm at a, a studio building 
right now that's empty. We're in the we're just about ready to sell this uh, in the process of selling this, and we close next week. And uh, I was actually uh, sitting at home getting ready to do twerk, and you know, getting all excited. I talked to Catfish the other day about all the cool stuff that he's doing, and I get a phone call that. Um, we have an AM and, and three translators here, two translators here, uh, that the translators were silent. So I had to run down here and it turns out I, the, uh, the AD converter they used was not from angry audio and it died. So, uh, <laughs> what was going on was the, uh, audio from the studio wasn't making it to the, uh, to the translators because of a dead AD converter. So we got that, uh, out of the way and, and I'm back and you know, it's been a while since I've been there. It's interesting. I, I basically built a station from the ground up. So um, that was pretty cool. Uh, antenna, transmission line, transmitter, HD, all that stuff. So um, that's why I've been I've been gone. We have all these things going on. Uh, we should be done this coming week, uh, or next week, rather, by Friday. And then all of a sudden, my schedule gets much lighter again, and I'll be happy. <laughs> Um, hey, speaking of being happy, uh, how in, in, in let's plan our show while it's on the air. Uh, how long can you stick with us today? Just a minute or two, or can you kind of hang on for a while? Uh, I can hang on for a little bit. Um, I'm on my cell phone, obviously, so yeah, yeah. it kind of depends on that. But um, okay. yeah, I mean, what what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking. Let, let me uh, talk about Nautel for a minute, and then we're going to come back, and w maybe we should take our first segment of the show with you and Catfish. I know that that since you are a very active engineer full time uh, with your company, Magna Media, that that you um, you know you have some things to ask Catfish uh, more so than I get to. I you know I I, I use a few of his products, but uh, it'd be good to to kind of get your conversation uh, get that get through that you know, while, while you're available. Sure. And then, uh, then Mike has some um, new products to show us off. And I've got some kind of philosophical questions about the direction of studios. Cause I, I see, you know, some real bifurcation uh, going on in, in what people need in their studios. And I, I think uh, Catfish has some ideas about that. Hey, our show is brought to you uh, in part by Nautel. I want to remind you about their new VX line of transmitters. These are shipping and they're amazing. The VX series goes from 150 watts up to 6 kilowatts. Now, these are analog FM rack mount transmitters. These are good, solid, basic transmitters. Um, so far at the moment, I don't think they're doing any uh, HD yet, but they do have built-in RDS, a built-in RDS generator. Uh, they have a GPS input to uh, keep you uh, very synchronized if you need to be you know, locked onto frequency. Uh, lots of powerful presets. So you can use one of these Nautel VX transmitters as a backup, like for all your stations. Some stations, uh, some uh, broadcast companies, mine included, uh, in Mississippi, we're doing this with an Autel transmitter. Uh, we plug it into a wideband antenna, and then we make provisions so that we can feed it any audio. And then we can also remote to it and put it on any frequency and power level that we need to, uh, at least into that one bay antenna, so that uh, we've got a backup for every one of our stations. Granted, it's, you know, uh, not as powerful uh, in, in most cases of our transmitters, but it does a great job. And it's there when we need it. Uh, it works into this uh, wideband antenna that's not negatively affected by ice on the tower. So it's it's pretty cool. Also, they're... they're um, uh, VX150 and the 300 series, those are type certified for low power FM. And that means they have all the filtering that is legally needed for the transmitter to operate as an LP FM transmitter. Of course, you can also use it as an exciter. You got a, a transmitter that needs some excitation going into it. Well, use a Nautel VX series for that too. Uh, and they're ideal for AM translators. So you have an, uh, a license to uh, be on FM for your AM station. Man, yeah. Check it out. Uh, the VX150 through the VX2 are available right now. The VX3 through VS, VX6, those are coming uh, in this, the first half of this year. So we're almost to the end of the first half of the year. Uh, they're modular in their construction, uh, slide out power supplies. You can change the, uh, the um, uh, PA uh, amplifier palette without any soldering. It, it uh, literally screws in, screws out. So it's very servable. Even if you're on a mountaintop, and you know, a lot of these transmitters, like a couple of mine, are on mountaintops and getting there is no small feat. Sometimes, a, well, a helicopter is involved for one of my sites. 
So it's nice to be able to go there and know that if there's a problem, you're going to be able to, to fix it either by configuration or, you know, if something's blown up, you're going to be able to swap it out. Check it out from Nautel at Nautel.com, their VX series. All righty. Hey, it's um, Kirk Harnack, Chris Tarr, and Mike Dosh are with us. Um, and uh, Chris, I, I wonder if you might start by making uh, a couple of comments uh, or if you have any questions for Mr. Dosh before we get into his presentation. Well, you know, it's funny because he and I just talked for, oh, probably almost an hour yesterday or the day before. So yesterday. So I don't know that I got anything off the top of my head. I'm trying to think of what we talked about yesterday that might be interesting. I know uh, we were talking about uh, bike processing. And one of the issues that we have with mic processing is that there are so many different types of microphones and speakers is one size doesn't fit all. And you have all these knobs and, 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 and twisty things and buttons. Um, and each time you put a different mic in, you have to remember kind of what my favorite settings are for this mic or my favorite settings are for that mic. Or, you know, you, you talk to your friends and go, what are you using? You know, life would be a lot simpler if we didn't have, you know, all of these different things these different parameters and controls and adjustments. Uh, it just so happens, I believe, Mike, that you've solved that problem. Well, we've, we have taken a different approach to it, uh, Chris. And uh, so, we, yeah, we're going to be talking today about a couple of new products. One of them is called the Chameleon Smooth, uh, which is a microphone processor that's made for the SM7 microphone. And the Chameleon Rebel, which is a microphone processor made for the... Um, uh, the uh, the Electro Voice RE20 and 27 microphones, and uh, so it's a little different approach in that rather than you know here's a box that has a bunch of knobs on it, plug in whatever you want, and then make a bunch of adjustments. A lot of the adjustments, the algorithms are custom tailored in advance for the particular microphone that this product is made for. So you get you get a lot more uh, you get instant gratification. You plug in the microphone and it sounds good. And you can still do some fine tuning. There are some, you know, some controls for making minor adjustments, but it's not like you have to, uh, not like you have to work really hard to to get it in the right area code. Whereas with with many mic processors, that's exactly what you have to do. Or maybe I, I'll put it a different way: you can't make it sound bad, and uh, and that's a good <laughs> thing when it comes to mic processing. Sure. So you know, you kind of hit something a little bit there about plugging it in and going. And it seems like a lot of your products are based that way. Not a lot of controls, not a lot of configuration. Most of them, you know, Chameleon is a great example. Um, even some of your, your DA stuff, you know, it's just, it's very simple. You plug it in and you go. And, and that's really almost counter to what a lot of us are used to dealing with over time. What, what gave you that epiphany, I guess, that less is more in these situations? You, you may not like the answer. It has a lot to do with our industry and uh, and the fact that uh, I suppose when I started in this business, uh, I was making products for engineers who might have been responsible for one, maybe two stations in a market. And there were a lot of engineers. And uh, nowadays, uh, we have engineers that are responsible for entire cities full of stations, sometimes entire markets that represent multiple cities. Uh, there are fewer engineers out there, which means that there's a lot less time to be fiddling with stuff. So when we when we make our products, we think about that. We think, you know, for example, we have a streaming audio processor. You mentioned Chameleon. Uh, it is an AI processor. It pays attention to the music that's coming in or the content that's coming in, makes adjustments automatically. So rather than the the you know the old days of tweaking the processor, getting in the car, listening for a while, making sure the PD is happy, going back in, tweaking some more. Uh, this does all of the adaptation, all of the tweaking on its own without engineering intervention. So it's uh, it's not for everybody. You know, if you, if you like to spend days on end adjusting things, uh, maybe our products aren't suited for you. But if you're looking for something that uh, that solves a problem quickly and uh, without a lot of com complexity, uh, well, there is complexity, but we kind of hide that and uh, so it doesn't require as much of your time to to deal with complexity uh, then uh, then you're probably going to like our, our approach to the products I know from my point of view it's been a it's it's kind of both ways you know I, I I like to tweak and I like to play 
on the other hand, and I think we joked about this a while back, it's kind of, you know, like with the chameleons in corny retrust, where, uh, you know, a lot of these devices now that are kind of all in one like this, you know, you kind of have to trust that the designers knew what they were doing when they designed it so that, you know, really you plug it in and go, but it really is kind of counterintuitive to what we do these days. However, I think, um, again, you know, talking about things like Spooth and Rebel and the Chameleon products and even some of these other things you'll be talking about soon, um, you know, not a lot of people have thought about the fact that a lot of a lot of what these things are going to be installed by not necessarily super tech people, that these are going to be maintained and put in by, by non-technical people. Um, on the same token, how how do you and uh, I, I know you got you and Corny have had back, you know, like the Steve Jobs thing. Can you make this simpler? Can you make this simpler? Has it become kind of a challenge? It is a challenge. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, with the mic processor we were just speaking about a moment ago, and we're, we're going to look at it in detail in about uh, 10, 15 minutes. But uh, uh, I, I remember on this product, it, uh, it started out with a lot more knobs and a, lo and a lot more adjustment range. And so we kind of challenged each other and we ended up with a, with a, a different approach to the product to make it simpler. Um, you mentioned, Chris, that a lot of our products are aimed at non-technical users, and that's, that's half true. Okay, so we, we do, in fact, market our products to content creators, podcasters, and, uh, and other creators. Uh, but the other half of our market is radio broadcasters. And, uh, you know, so it's not just non-technical users. It's also highly technical users who are highly critical uh, and want the products to be fantastic, but don't necessarily have a lot of time to, uh, to, to make these adjustments. And, uh, and I know... Uh, I don't want to pick on you, but uh, but I think you were a little bit skeptical when uh, when you ended up with our preprocessor because I think you wanted more adjustments. You know, I want I'm going to want to tweak this more than uh, than these guys are going to let me tweak it. And I think ultimately you were pretty satisfied with the uh, uh, with the product, even though you didn't get to make as in, as many personal adjustments as you wanted to. Am I wrong? No, you're you're absolutely right. I I remember seeing this and and even talking about it, going well, you know. There's not a lot going on here. And you kept saying, it's all under the hood. It's all under your hood. And that's where I came up with the joke of in corny retrust. You know, I kind of had to in just corny put it we in trust. There. Yep. I had, had to put it in. And, and, and it, you know, I mean, everybody knows I put these into all my stations. I've been so happy with them. But it did. I mean, it took a leap of faith because I'm not one to just stick a black box, you know, in, into a rack. And it's a little more than a black box. But, you know, I, I, to, to just kind of let go of that control. Um, and, and knowing that the people who were behind it, you know, really knew what they were doing and, and that I could trust that this thing's going to do what it does. And it does. And it's fantastic. But I think that's, you know, I, I, that's a, I, I think we as, as, as professional engineers are kind of coming to that slowly. You and I were talking yesterday about, you know, Raspberry Pi being in products and, and stuff like that, where, you know, I'm still not, you know, totally sold on complete software processors and things like that. And that's just more of, you know, I have to make that leap, get in there and try it and, and let it happen. And, you know, that's what I did with the chameleon. I'm like, well, you know, worst case, I could pull it back out. And, you know, the first one I put in is still there. So I do think that, um, you know, I, I do think that that's a, it's a real interesting challenge that you've kind of put yourself and, and Corny and, and the rest of your crew in is trying to make these things that work really, really well without um, getting in the way or, or being complicated. It's kind of the Steve Jobs thing where, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, you, you can give the person a lot of things to break, make it sound really bad, and then get the blame for that. <laughs> I think is is one of the better ways to put that. You know, sometimes it's great to have all that control, but if you can never get it sound right, everybody blames the box when, you know, really, it was more of the the controls. So, I, I do know uh, I do know how that's like. And again, processors are like that. Even even things like, um, you know, some of the things you have coming down the pipe that you'll be talking about are, are that way. But then there's another side to this. You know, not everything is all about ease. But you've really kind of found a niche, I think, in the products that you're delivering. You're you're kind of filling a hole there that that existed, but nobody was really paying attention to. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of your philosophy there. 
Well, you know, I've been doing this for for quite a long time, and uh, I guess you know, you you know that I was the uh, the 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 guy that started the console company for Telos uh, Axia, and before that, I was designing mixing consoles and other products for PRNE. So I've been doing this a long time, and uh, one thing that's very common to most of uh, most of the products in the industry is they're generally bristling with features. Uh, that's not uncommon. We can throw more features in here. And then one customer comes along and says, well, uh, why doesn't it do this? Oh, we can do that. And they could just keep throwing more and more features at the product uh, to the point where it becomes, uh, forgive me, Microsoft Word. Uh, you know, sometimes you just want to write a letter. You know, you, 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 you don't want to have automated, automated indexing and, you know, paragraph formatting and 17 different ways to, uh, to organize your fonts. And uh, but that's what happens, you know. The the products ended up end up many times becoming very bloated, and uh, and that just makes it frustrating, especially for the people who aren't looking for, you know, that one feature that you develop for that one customer who absolutely had to have it in order to buy the products. So we we take a different approach. We try to make every product solve a problem, solve a specific problem, or or you know a group of related problems, and uh, and we try to keep each product as simple as it possibly can be without being too simple. And uh, yes, you're right. It is a niche. It's not for everybody. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got to throw a uh, a pause in in our in our fun here, gentlemen. We gotta we gotta uh, yeah. uh, make well, mention of a couple commercial uh, uh, things. I, and I, actually, I, think, first, Kirk, I, I, I gotta duck out anyway, so it's a good time for a break. Well, it's actually if, if you can hang on for another sixty seconds, the first break okay. is for angry audio. So uh, oh, maybe great. Chris Tarr, you could put your commercial hat on and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, it'd be, you, you know, Mike Dosh and I, in this interview, we're not, we're not doing any calls to action. It's, it's a one hour show about technology and solving problems. Uh, but you get to make a call for action. Uh, Mr. Tarr, what would you like okay. to talk about? I will do that. You me, oh, you want me to do it now? Okay. Absolutely. You can do it right now. You're on dude. Three, two, one, bam. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, you, you really just now got a whole history of, of some of the things that make uh, Angry Audio so great. But, you know, as, a, as an engineer in the field, I do a lot of work. I've got, you know, 20-some radio stations. I'm always looking for, um, you know, the easiest way to solve a problem. And, you know, a lot of times that is, as Catfish said, is the simplest. And, you know, it'd be great if I could live back in the days when I could build little switch consoles for things and, and tweak my processing and all those sorts of things. But today, you don't have the time to do that. If you're you know, an engineer in any size market, you've got a lot of things to worry about. And that's what I love about the Angry Audio products. They solve these little problems. You need a headphone jack and a studio? Don't bother drilling holes and running wires. You know, they've got a drop-in uh, product for that. Need a cough switch? They've got a product for that. All of these things are just really simple, inexpensive, easy to use devices, gasmo, uh, gadgets and gizmos that solve specific problems. You want processing? Boy, that's a great one. Uh, you know, the C, the, the C Chameleon C series, the C level, C6S, um, C4, uh, all great audio processors and all very specialized. Uh, they, they're there to make old processors sound amazing. They make new processors sound good, but they make those older processors sound fantastic. Uh, the mic processors, how about a mic processor? My goodness, where you can just plug it in and go. You can just plug it in the way it is and it sounds great. But you also have some functionality in there to tailor it uh, specifically to some of the ways you like. A little more bass, a little less bass, a little thump. Um, you know, all of those things are, you know, user adjustable. So it's not completely blank, but it gives you such a good starting point that you don't have to spend hours working on something. You know, if you're building out a studio, Angry Audio has the tally lights. They've got the headphone jacks. They've got gadgets. So if you walk away from the console, it pops your uh, headphones out so you don't break your headphone cables. How many times has that happened? All of these tiny little solutions that really just make doing this job a whole lot easier for everyone. So don't let problems get you down. If you're ha trying to solve little problems at the station, get angry. Angryaudio.com. I'm going to tell you right now, they have a solution for whatever problem you've got. Well, in the studio, at least. <laughs> Angryaudio.com. Thanks. And I, I love how uh, uh, Catfish cause, causes, I, I haven't figured out the, the delineation that may be a mystery we solved today, the difference between the gizmos and the gadgets. And if he runs out of there names, I've one. got, we, we've also got gazmos and gidgets. 
So that that we can you know. Well, that was my the mistake. Line. They don't really have that. It's gadgets and gizmos. Come on now. <laughs> All right. Hey, we're going to uh, be back. Thank you, Chris Tarr. Thank you so much for checking in with us uh, from the stu- your abandoned studio. Uh, appreciate that. Hey, our show is also brought to you in part by Max Connect Wireless. Josh Bone, thank you so much for what you're doing for the broadcast industry. Here's Gary Morrill to tell you why you should have one of these. I'm Gary Morrill, Midwest Regional Director of Engineering for Alpha Media. When I first spoke with Josh Bone about Max Connect, he told me they'd work great for remote transmitter sites where connectivity was a challenge. And you know, he's absolutely right. We even have sites where we're using this as a backup to our STL using Mac Connect's dual carrier option, and it works perfectly. We also have times where we need to be able to get out to a venue where it's kind of challenging because everybody and his brother is trying to stream video at the same time, like in a big sporting event. And you know what? Our data gets through every time because it's prioritized packet data. It works for us. It'll work for you. Max Connect. Check it out. I've got antennas on mine. This is the Max Connect. Uh, well, this is a cradle point um, uh, 4G LTE modem, but they also have other brands as well. Pep Link and, and, and more stuff and uh, quite a variety of things to suit what you need to do at your transmitter site or going out on remote. Check them out at Max Connect. It's spelled funny, I know. They do a whole bunch of different services, too. So if you need some custom engineering done, uh, they can handle that for you. If you need some uh, integration done, they can do that for you. And there's even more products coming out from Max Connect and the Max Connect Group. Thanks a lot, Josh Bone. All right, uh, we are here. Uh, thanks a lot to Chris Tarr for uh, making the effort to join us from uh, an emergency run he had to make. And Mike Dosh, Michael Catfish Dosh is with us. Mike, uh, where would you like to pick up from now? I actually. I'd, I'd like to mention one thing that had to do with what uh, what Chris had been saying. Um, when, when people were asking for more controls on on a mic processor or an audio processor, uh, I can hear you asking Mike and the question. Well, well, what if you really like the way it sounds? What if you really just like it and you don't feel you need to do anything? And that's one of the things that I like about what Cornelius Gould does, uh, his kind of, um, you know, chameleon type of uh, treatment of audio. Um, it, it, it just, it, wow, that sounds really good. Why would I want to mess with that? What do you think? Cor- Corny is, he's off the charts. Genius. You know, and uh, so he's been doing audio processing for a while. He had this insight years ago maybe even more than a decade ago, that, uh, that maybe the processor, if it made its adjustments uh, based on the content that was coming through it, that there'd be things that you could do differently. And uh, so he, uh, he, he had this idea, he called it Chameleon. It's a bril- brilliant name for what it is because the effects of the processor kind of hide. And uh, so He's using uh, he's using the content itself to hide the uh, the artifacts of the processing, so you, you really can't hear them. So you don't get control over things like attack times and release times and crossover points and mix levels. The uh, the software takes care of all of that, and uh, and it, and it does so in a very musical way. I, I I heard you interviewing Corny on your show not too long ago, Kirk, and you guys were talking about how it makes your ears happy when you listen to uh, to Corny's work, and uh, oh. and I think that's just a great way of saying it. So, yeah, you're you're right. It's a it's 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 a little bit jarring to look at one of our processors and to think, well, how how can that simple thing make be sounding good? You know, I'm used to the you know the 4RU device with the touch screen and the you know I mean this is a little tiny half rack unit. How can this sound so so good? And uh, the answer is that. Corny really knows what he's doing, and this is a brilliant n- insight he's had into uh, into how to process audio. What I really like is when guys like you, like Chris and you, Kirk, listen to the box and say, "Wow, I don't I don't need to make any adjustments." You know, I've mm-hmm. I've I've I, I consider that a huge win when and when someone who is a processing expert, um, and you know they know how to set up a processor. And I, you know, I had a guy. He's you, you know him very well. He's, uh, he's a major broadcaster. He loves to fine tune the Omnia Nine. He has one of those, and he could, you know, he can drive circles around everyone with it. And uh, and I, I was kind of 
sheepishly telling him about our Chameleon C4 streaming audio processor. And I, you know, this really isn't for you. I know you're not going to like it because you like to make adjustments. And he said, oh, yes, I love this idea because I don't want to spend time adjusting the streaming audio processors. I want to spend my time adjusting the over-the-air processors. So even, even processing experts are getting into this where I thought they would be kind of maybe a little put off by the idea of automation in the in the processor. So it's a, it's been a hit and people seem to really like it a lot. I was trying to analogize uh what what Corny is is doing and and it, it it's almost like you've just hired Corny to to do your processing uh for you because you what you've gotten is the best of what he knows how to do. This is how he would set up your processing anyway if it had all those controls. Right? That's exactly it. Yeah. And you know, he's oh. just, he's brilliant. Uh, yeah. So you've got some uh, other things that you'd like to, to talk about. And, and I, I wanted to kind of roll into the, into maybe this topic. I, I hope this works for you um, by, by introducing the idea that we've, we've seen a, a, a real split in what studios need. Uh, I work for a company that makes, you know, audio over IP stuff. Um, talking to some customers just today, looking at buying some big audio consoles that do a lot of stuff. And, you know, for, for gorgeous studios that are st still show places in a post COVID world, they still gonna, still gonna bring, you know, plenty of talent in and guests in they're real show off places. And then, then you've got a lot of people who are working from home or working from small studios, um, like uh, our friend, uh, Jeff McGinley. I'm gonna see Jeff next week. Um, Jeff uh, had a particular problem to solve that involved building a number of uh, small studios in various places around Portland, Oregon, and he just needed small audio consoles, analog consoles to go feed a digital system that was off site. And, and so he kind of got the, the best of both worlds, what he had to do to have uh, several people talking around the table uh, with zero latency. And then, but all that's still feeding uh, a, a, a console and automation system and commercials and all that, that was off site from where, where this was. So I, I, there's this real bifurcation going on of what do people need um, to create content that they're interested in, in creating, have it just go smoothly and easily and nothing really get in your way. And you seem to be looking at fulfilling um, part of, of that whole situation. Would you agree? Well, yeah, I, uh, I, I certainly have been uh, around consoles and studios for my entire career. And uh, so I, I do have some thoughts on, on how this can be done. Uh, I've done pretty much all of it. I've done analog consoles, uh, IP consoles for Telos, and uh, uh, even software-based consoles for Lavo. And uh, so, you know, I've kind of I've kind of seen the whole gamut and how you can put these different pieces together to do different things. Uh, and and I don't think that we've arrived yet. I still think that we're kind of um, we're still grasping at it a bit, and uh, we're trying to deal with the fact that there's ideas. You know, we've got uh, some, some, sometimes I have my talent working remotely and I need to do something for him. Uh, but there isn't necessarily an off the shelf something. So the engineers are stepping into the gap and putting different packages together. Everything from, you know, I, I'm going to put a roadcaster, uh, roadcaster pro at a remote studio. Then I'm going to connect that up to the internet somehow, use a codec, get this back to the main studio. Uh, and then you're always dealing with issues once you once you make these decisions like, well, that particular talent that I gave this product to accidentally knocked the fader down and he doesn't know that it's down. And now he's calling because he's off the air and I have to drive out to his house to help him fix it. And, you know, so e even when you have all this great technology, you're still dealing with, the you know, the human problems, the, uh, you know, the, the fact that maybe an approach that you've taken isn't intuitive enough for all levels of talent. And uh, so I don't, I don't really think we've arrived, but I do think there's some interesting tech uh, that's, uh, that's emerging. And in particular, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to plug your company, but I'm going to plug your company. Uh, I think Telos has some kind of cool uh, tech that's, uh, that's, that's emerging. There's the, uh, the new Altus mixer, which is uh, a, a you know, cloud-based uh, mixing engine, software-based mixing engine that could be it could run on uh, Amazon Web Services, or it could be run on premise on your own server, and uh, and this this opens up new possibilities. You think about that mix engine sitting out there someplace, and maybe I have audio that's originating by you know from from a cloud-based server, for example, and it doesn't need to come back 
down to the planet in order to uh, to go back up to the server you know it just it just makes a connection and now i i just need to find ways to get my live elements into that and uh, in some cases maybe if it's voip even the live elements some of them can make direct connections right into this you know this cloud based uh, mixer mm-hmm. and uh, so this could change the way we build studios maybe in a very significant way you know, we, we might, you know, in the old days, we had these massive mixing consoles, you know, 30, 34 input ma- mixing consoles with A and B inputs and sources, you know, just, just uh, unimaginable uh, numbers of different kinds of source equipment, everything from turntables to CDs to, you know, computers eventually, reel-to-reel tape machines, cart machines, you know, cassette machines, all the different things <laughs> that you might want to put on the air would be hooked up to these consoles. And, uh, and then, you know, Automation systems took over and uh, and kind of eliminated just about all of that source equipment, and uh, and yet and yet consoles still for the most part uh, kind of look like they used to. We we went to different technology. We went to IP, and uh, and so that that made the computer to console connection easier. Uh, we were able to stay natively within a language that the computer was able to speak, uh, but in particular consoles are are still large, you know, physical things that we tend to think of as the kind of the originating point of the show. And uh, maybe that changes. Maybe with the mix engine elsewhere or in the cloud or down the hall or whatever, we can start thinking about maybe interacting with it differently. And what I love about the Telos approach is it's an HTML5 browser interface, which means Ah. any computing device can control it. Now, some people are going to freak out and they're going to say, well, I, I hate this idea because, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not physical faders. And there's answers to that, too. And we can talk about those. But by using technology the way Telos is using the technology in this case, they're able to open up new ways of doing things that we may be able to, uh, you know, change the way we operate our studios accordingly. Got you. Wow. Okay, that that was a mouthful. Um, all right, and and uh, thank you for taking it in that direction of explaining, you know, where where the you know the, the IP based side of it is the technology side, um, but it still kind of needs some some things that humans I- interact with if they are well. Yeah. I, I've, I've certainly done a few drawings and thinkings uh, of, and dealing with uh, with groups about okay, how are we going to handle uh, talent at home? Um, if they're voice tracking, that's one thing. There's there's tools out there to do that. But if you want to be live, if you want to do a, a live morning show, and even during COVID, uh, you had morning shows where people would gather at somebody's house, right? It may be a, may have been a husband wife team. They may have had you know the the, the third person from the morning crew uh, come over to the house, talk around a kitchen table. They had some technical problems to solve. The biggest one being um, they need to hear each other with with zero latency you you can't each individually be connected through a codec uh to to a mixing console somewhere because you're going to hear each other in the same room and v- v- via the delay you've got to hear each other um and maybe i'm focusing too much on on, on the little thing but i i the, you know the answer would be having a, a mixing console there at at, at the at, at the home at, at the at, at the remote office um you want to tell us where, well, where you've it, been uh, it, thinking about it? It might that? be a little thing. You you, you uh-huh. call it a little thing, Kirk, but it's a deal killer. <laughs> it's, well. You know, it's yeah, it's a, it's a small thing. Uh, you know, uh, people need to be able to hear each other while they're interacting to make a show. Uh, but if they can't hear each other while they're interacting to make a show, you don't have a show. So it's a it's a big thing. And yeah, and, uh, and you're absolutely if, right. It might be cool. If, Go ahead. If, if I could jump into with just one thing, years ago, back when when Chris Tobin was with us and he was my co-host, I was visiting New York City, and we thought, hey, uh, instead of both of us trying to squeeze into the same camera shot, you know, shoulder to shoulder, why don't we just get on separate sides of uh, this sports studio that was at CBS Radio? What a beautiful studio it was, absolutely gorgeous. We weren't going to use the the console that was in there. We were each just going to be on our own laptop, and we were fifteen feet apart from each other. We thought that'd be enough, you know, separation, and we each had earbuds or something like that, and and our own microphone. So we get on on twerk. We were doing the twerk show, and I probably Suncast was producing the the, the show. And we realized that this was absolutely impossible. It couldn't be done. It was horrible to hear Chris 15 feet away 
and hear him with 300 milliseconds round trip delay. It was, it was, it, we, we got through the, to the first break and we said, Chris, one of us has to leave. <laughs> one of us has to go somewhere. And Chris grabbed his laptop and out the door he ran to another place where he could plug in and, and be on the internet. And as long as I couldn't hear him, you know, through the air, it worked fine. The, 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 the delay wasn't a problem, but you can't have two people in the same room with two different ways of hearing the other person. And the long way is not so good. So uh, th that that yeah, well, proved so to me in no uncertain terms that we, we got to solve this. Yeah, it's a it's it's a real problem. Uh, I think uh, I think the the software that I mentioned before, Altus uses WebRTC for mm -hmm. um, codec returns, right? So uh, you'd be able to listen. You know, imagine imagine you're sitting in front of a laptop and you're controlling this mix console. And, uh, and then you're interacting with it. Maybe you have a mic and a, and a pair of headphones going through, I don't know, an M audio interface, right? You know, some, mm -hmm. some USB interface that's connected to your laptop. Uh, and it's the same laptop you're using to control this thing. Uh, as long as what you got back from this thing, uh, even, you know, even with WebRTC, uh, because of the latency involved, you would have to have a mix minus back. Uh, without a mix yeah. minus back, it won't work. But if you could hear all of the show except yourself, uh, and uh, and then you heard yourself locally, basically you were just able to, uh, you know, to listen to the not me feed, which is the mix mm -hmm. minus, and then the me feed, which is local microphone, and you were able to blend these together to taste. You've got yourself a, uh, uh, you got yourself a workable situation. So then, we complicate it when we add other people into the same studio. You know, yeah, uh, because uh, if it's just you and, a, and, you know, and your microphone, your headphones, that's not so bad. But now I've got two or three other guests. We're trying to interact with each other. They all need to be able to listen to that same mix minus. And it needs to be mix minus group. It can't just be mix minus source. So in this case, it would have to be uh, all, all three of my guests. We're all mixed together locally so we can hear each other. And also, our mic feeds are going up to the uh, the mix engine, and then what we're hearing back is everything the mix engine has except for all of us. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, mm -hmm. then you're going to have you know this mix minus group. You're going to have the ability to hear each other and interact. And the only latency you're going to experience is a bit of show latency. So yeah. you know there's going to be a you know a little bit of gap between program elements and your interacting with them, but you know, we're talking a fraction of a second. So this is, this is not an issue. Uh, hey, and I, uh, so I could imagine ways that you could build studios in the future using tech where the, uh, the console, uh, the, you know, the, the, the logical part of the console, the mix engine itself is elsewhere using different technology. If, if, if there's one uh, aspect of this tech, I'd like to point out for those interested. Um, the example you've been given kind of implies that if you let's say you had two or three people in the same physical room but the mix engine and all the other audio components music uh commercials whatever were elsewhere up in the cloud and there's delay there uh, you could certainly mix you and the other people in your room together and send that as one you know audio feed out to where it's going and and then the audio coming back would be a mix minus it wouldn't include any of the your voices that we're sending up and you'd mix that in your headphones and listen to both and, and that's going to be fine that, that works quite well um the bbc uh some years ago did this vilor project where they um they were sending the microphones individually up into the cloud to the mix engine and so they just had a bit more complication the mix minus that came back could include none of the individual feeds that were going up so it, it didn't matter whether you mix them together locally and send that mix up or whether you send them individually up and control them individually remotely either way you've got to send a mix minus back that includes nothing that came from your studio so yeah so uh and anything that comes from your if you're playing a sound effect in your studio that needs to be heard locally with zero latency or low latency through a, a local mixer. So there's, I, I just wanted to point out, there's actually two, a couple ways of doing this, whether you're sending a complete mix up of your mics, of the local talent, or individual uh, mics up. The, the net is still the same. Your local people cannot listen to a round trip of somebody that was sitting next to them. Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting tech. It really is. And uh, I, at this point, I'm not sure that it's productized 
in mm-hmm. all the different ways that it will be productized in the future. Ah, in other words, you know, yeah. right now it's an interesting product and I look at it and I'm, I'm relatively intrigued by it. And in fact, I'm thinking about making some products at Angry Audio that work with it. In other words, you know, here's this cool product, this cool tech, and there's some things we could do to work with it and make, uh, make more interesting products for both companies. Uh, but I think also that's going to evolve. And uh, the way it'll evolve is as customers get exposed to it, they're going to start saying, oh, well, this is cool the way you productized it, but have you ever thought of such and such or so-and-so? Or I'm trying to do this thing over here that you didn't think of before. And that's how products evolve. So it, it, it may have started out as, you know, this idea of doing remote, uh, you know, remote, you know, remote contribution, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think over time it could evolve into something else. It could be the future of the way we build radio studios, but you know, that's a, that's a big statement at this point. I can't, I can't predict that, but it looks very intriguing to me. You, you, we have, uh, I wouldn't say frittered, but we we have uh, talked most of the hour already and you've got some pictures to show us. Uh, can, can you give us a little tease as to what, what, uh, what we're going to see after this, uh, this next message from, from Innovonics? Sure. What would you like to tell? Uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, Suncast has some of this oh, ready to oh, show, you want, I guess. You want, me, you want me to tease you about what we're going to talk about after your commercial? Yeah, I tease it. me, tease me. So uh, uh, let me let me show you some products that had you gone to NAB, uh, you might have missed them. Uh, mm-hmm. Or if you did see them, we're going to give you a little more detail on it. And if you didn't go to NAB, then, uh, then this will really be cool because you're going to get to see what we introduced at NAB as far as new products. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. we'll tell you what we're going to, I, I think we're, we need to do the, the ad, uh, first and we'll come back and, and see some cool things. Um, so, uh, Hey, Innovonics is one of our sponsors through broadcasters general store at bgs.cc. And I want to show you something. If, if uh, Suncast can get this up on the screen, this exists, th- th- this is an Innovonics uh, product and good golly is shame on me for not knowing the model number of this one. Uh, after years of not being able to effectively monitor what is on our air remotely. And I had, I had worked up some ways of doing it through changing different feeds into an extra streaming processor that I had. Uh, I I had some ways to listen to our off air feeds, but they were all, they involved, well, only I could do it. Okay. I had to go in, I had to manipulate some, um, some, some, uh, uh, live wire channels and, and get things to feed me. And I knew how to do it for me, but you know, my business partners really couldn't. We got this Innovonics box and some of you are familiar with this already. It's wonderful. Um, some of you are not. This is so cool. Uh, you're looking at a list. This is a tuner that uh, also shows you RDS. So it confirms that your RDS is working. Uh, shows you how much multipath and noise is going on there, which uh, you can have more than one antenna onto this. But it shows you all the RDS information and you can listen back over your web browser. I'm not going to ask Kat, uh, I'm not going to ask uh, Suncast to, to do it. But uh, you see in the upper left here, there you can choose, uh, you can drop down and choose your bit rate, and then you can hit the speaker uh, icon there and listen to the station that you have selected. There you go, 32, 64, 128 kilobits. And then you can choose your station. And Suncast, you're welcome to choose some different stations from presets down there. Um, we have different uh, stations. This is at one of our studio locations in Mississippi, and we can listen to WKXY. Uh, WMYQ, WNLA, BYB, as you can see, uh, we can listen to uh, WNIX coming uh, all the way from the translator uh, over in Greenville. Uh, KZYQ is there, WZYQ, WIQQ, and if you scroll down a bit, there's also WDTL. So we can pick up, we've got a great outdoor uh, uh, Yagi antenna uh, and that picks all these up. And it's it's this is this has been an absolute boon to our operations. And, and why? I'll tell you why. Uh, this box from, from Innovonics that is so easy to access remotely, um, this does the job that, frankly, our local employees just don't seem cut out to do. You know, we, we'd like to be able to verify when they say, hey, uh, our station uh, KZYQ is off the air. Okay, what does that mean? What does that mean? And I know Chris Tarr goes through the same thing. What does that mean off the air? Does that mean the automation quit? Does that mean there's a problem in the audio chain? Does, does that mean that the STL doesn't work? Does that mean that some computer needs to be rebooted? Does that mean that the power's off at the transmitter site? Uh, does that mean that you know, the antenna fell off the tower? What, what does that mean that we're off the air? And you know, I'm a seven hour drive away. I'm an eight hour drive away from KZYQ. So how do you determine this? 
Well, this box from Innovonics, oh my goodness, what what a terrific thing it is that lets us listen uh, to see the parameters, including our RDS parameters, much more accurately than we could with a random car radio. Sometimes we we try setting things up with that, and they all behave differently. Uh, but this uh, this Innovonics box, just amazing in what it lets you see. Um, I highly recommend this. You need to go to the Innovonics uh, website. And uh, we'll put the show uh, a link to it in, in, in the show notes or go to BGS.cc, BGS.cc. That's Broadcasters General Store. And man, they can supply you with all kinds of broadcast stuff, the stuff that you need from, from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower, if you to steal my slogan. Uh, just amazing stuff, including the whole line from Innovonics, mod monitors, stream monitors, rebroadcasting receivers. Uh, of course, the, the, the Justin 808 to, to make sure that your FM and your HD1 are perfectly aligned with each other. And I have just found so much use for uh, this, this uh, off-air monitor that's web-based from Innovonics. Thanks so much, Innovonics, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. I really appreciate you. You have made my life easier, and now we can verify things quite readily from literally 300 miles away. All right. Thanks a lot, BGS. Well, we're here with Mike Dosh. we got a few minutes remaining. Mike, okay, let's take a look at some products real quick that you've uh, you've brought with you. All right. Suncast, uh, how, about, uh, how about you throw that presentation up? New 2023 new stuff. Okay, so I'm going to go quickly. I know we don't have a lot of time. This is the Chameleon C-Level Studio Processor. It is designed to replace um, the, uh, uh, the compeller uh, or the Ariane as a studio side loudness governor. And it uh, works great as a preprocessor before, uh, you know, in fact, Chris Tarr was referring to these earlier. Uh, he puts them in front of Omni 11s, and, uh, and he, uh, he's really delighted with the, uh, with the sound that he's getting out of them. I, I like them in front of some older processors like the Omnia 6, for example. I think it makes it sound like a brand new modern processor. But it's a, mm-hmm. it's a multi-band leveling device, multi-band AGC. And uh, so let's move on. This is brand new, uh, Chameleon C6S. The uh, Chameleon C6S, the S is for software. It is not a controller for one of our hardware processors. It is actually processing software that runs natively either in Windows or Mac OS environment. It's available as as, uh, uh, standalone applications uh, and also as plugins, VST plugins for Windows environments and uh, uh, AU plugins for Mac OS environments. Hmm. And uh, this actually sounds very much like our Chameleon C4, which is our live stream hardware processor. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's got the same processing engine at its core, but it adds some personality controls. Basically, uh, Corny's opened it up a little bit and he lets you have a little bit more influence over the AI. And uh, so it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's available now for uh, for download and demo. And uh, hmm. mm-hmm. uh, if you want to go ahead and go through the next uh, the next couple of shots, these are just screenshots of the same product. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, if you go back, just one. Uh, thank you. This is the ITU 1770 loudness page. Uh, one of the cool features about this Chameleon and also the C4, the hardware processor, is that you can set a loudness target for your streams. So you could say, for example, I want this stream to be minus 17 luffs. And once you've set that target, it is completely automatic in terms of maintaining that loudness uh, over time. And that's a, that's a really unique and cool feature, especially now that, uh, uh, that the live streaming environment, which has been the Wild West in terms of loudness up until now, is starting to get a little bit more clever about maintaining loudness standards. Uh, so you can uh, you can go ahead and move on, Suncast. Thank you. Uh, this is a new product called the USB Audio Gizmo, and uh, it is a very simple product. You plug this into your computer's USB port, and you get high-quality audio in and out. Uh, it is unique in a few ways. Uh, it is a class-compliant device, meaning that when you plug it into Windows, when you plug it into Mac, uh, when you plug it into Linux, uh, all of these operating systems will recognize it as an audio device without drivers. You know, you don't need special drivers for this, and uh, and it it can very easily just uh, just be used. 
Uh, it is uh, fully isolated from input to output. One of the biggest problems with uh, um, internal sound cards you, and motherboard sound card audio uh, is uh, generally it's unbalanced audio, and uh, and it's coming from a pretty noisy environment. So you think, well, okay, I'm going to use a USB audio device, and so you uh, you have some external thing, and you think, oh, I've gotten away from all that noise, but in many cases, especially with the lower cost devices, uh, they end up using the USB power uh, to, uh, you know, to on, on the audio side. So you end up with a ground loop with your filthy computer. And uh, so this is one of the reasons why sometimes you hear this complaint about why am I hearing this high pitched whine in my uh, in my computer audio? And uh, this can often be just nothing more than a ground loop. And uh, so we we have three levels of isolation. We regenerate USB power. Uh, we, uh, we have fully isolated data and we have fully isolated, um, let's see, data, audio, and, uh, and power. So these are, uh, these are all fully isolated. And so you, you don't have any connection, any electrical connection that is capable of making a ground loop between your audio and your, uh, and your computer. Uh, also it's, uh, it's fully balanced. Uh, inputs and outputs capable of plus 24 dBU, uh, which is also very unusual for lower cost USB uh, sound devices, which usually top out at maybe plus 12 dBU or plus 15 dBU, something like that. So it's pro level in, pro level out, uh, and it's uh, um, shipping now. We can't build them fast enough. We can move on. Next slide, please. There you go. This is cool. Uh, we were talking about the Max Connect and Josh Bone earlier. So he came to me and he said, hey, I got this idea. And, uh, and it's such a good idea. No one's done it before that, uh, that I said, yeah, we have to do this. So we're, uh, this is a collaboration. Um, Josh's idea, our, uh, our, our engineering, I guess. And uh, so it's a, uh, it's a USB audio uh, gadget in this case. And I'll show you why in just a moment. That, uh, that has composite output. And so this is very specifically made for software audio processors like Stereo Tool and Breakaway. Uh, these are really interesting products, uh, but they, it takes a lot of effort to actually make these products work in a, uh, you know, in a broadcast environment. So what we've done is we've said, look, here's, a, uh, you know, here's a audio inputs, uh, analog audio inputs, analog out audio outputs, stereo, uh, you've got composite outputs that can drive the you know the next device in your in your signal chain. Uh, you've got a USB port there that connects to the computer that's running the software, and then you have digital inputs and outputs. And the digital output runs at 192 kilohertz sample rate, so you get uh, uh, you get full composite digital output if 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 your software processor is capable of of generating that. And the digital input is sample rate converted. So if your console doesn't happen to generate 192 kilohertz sample rate, it doesn't matter. You can, uh, you can ingest 48 kilohertz, and then this box will do what you need to do. So for us, it's kind of the missing link. It's the, it's the product that's really been needed in order to make software audio processors more, uh, more appropriate or more professional for the actual you know use case which is uh, radio broadcasting in this case uh, we can move on hmm. okay this mm -hmm. is the smooth microphone processor you're looking at the front panel uh, the, uh, the 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 key to the name this is chameleon smooth the key to the name is the first two letters which are underlined there so smooth means sm so this processor was made for the SM microphone, in this case, the SM7. But if you happen to be lucky enough to have an SM5, uh, it works really well with this, this box too. Uh, in fact, any sure dynamic microphone is gonna be within the, you know, within the target range of this product. So maybe you have an MV, for example, or an SM7, SM5, as I mentioned, even an SM58 or a 57. These these products will all sound fantastic with this processor. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is the back panel. You've got a microphone input, uh, a line input. If you don't want to use our preamp, if you have one already, it's got analog line output on Studio Hub and XLR. Uh, 
It's got AES-EBU outputs, XLR and Studio Hub, and it's got a remote control mm -hmm. connector, which you could use because we actually provide for you on-off cough functionality right in the processor. So if you happen to be connected to a non-broadcast board where you don't have that logic, you can get the logic in the mic processor and then, you know, do your muting here uh, before it goes on its way. If you could go back to the previous slide, let me, uh, let me just very quickly show you. If you take the security panel off, mm. uh, you can see that there's a handful of controls underneath there. And uh, so the top view is what your user sees. And uh, the bottom view is what the engineer sees. So you take mm. the security panel off, make a few adjustments, set things up the way you want to, and then uh, uh, put the security back back panel back on and, you, and you're finished. So let's skip ahead two slides. And this is the Rebel mic processor. Again, the keys in the first two letters. So this, this is for the RE microphones, the Electro Voice RE20, RE27, RE16, maybe the RE10. But basically, if it's any of the RE family of microphones, this processor is the one. Looks very similar to the Smooth. The name is different and the software is different, but the features are very similar. Algorithms are quite different, though, because these two microphones require different contours and uh, different approaches. So really, it's, it's different software in the same basic hardware box. Uh, but uh, the idea is I buy, the, I buy the box that's appropriate for the microphone. And then once I set it up, I, uh, I just forget about it because it sounds amazing. And uh, we can move on. And now we have the uh, Rave Radio Mixer. This is a brand new console from us, brand new audio console from us. Uh, I've designed radio consoles for many, many years, many of them, in fact. And, uh, and we bought the company that used to be known as Radio Systems a few years ago. And uh, this company also had a number of, uh, of radio consoles. Unfortunately, we had to discontinue the radio systems consoles because they were too expensive for what they did. And uh, um, it, it, was, it was just time for them not to be made anymore. And uh, so we've had a lot of requests from people who were looking for some kind of a uh, you know, non-IP radio console. Not everybody needs, uh, you know, a ten or $15,000 IP radio console. Many people just need a simple board that, uh, that does some mixing and monitoring and, you know, the usual features, but maybe not all the sophisticated features that you would get if you bought an IP console. And uh, so we, we designed this. It's, a, it's an eight-fader console. If you go to the next slide, we can take a look at some of the features. Uh, it's an eight-fader console, all eight inputs or stereo line inputs the first four positions can be stereo line or microphone it has preamps built in four four preamps built in this is unusual in this price class usually uh, usually when you're buying a lower cost console they'll tell you how many mics you get so let's say they tell you you know channels one and two are for microphone well in that case if you only have one microphone then you have a dead fader you can't use or if you have three microphones, you have to do something for that third fader because you don't have a preamp. Didn't come with the board, so you know it's 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 never quite right. It's very rare that you would actually have exactly two microphones. So we we took a different approach. We said you can have uh, any anywhere from one to four microphones. You you decide what you want, and then the uh, whatever uh, whatever channels are not microphones, then uh, then those will be stereo line inputs. Hmm. Uh, it is a dual bus system, program one, program two, or program one, uh, uh, program and audition. I was using Telos nomenclature. Sorry, Kirk. It's program <laughs> and audition. Uh, and, uh, and preview. Preview is a Q or PFL. This is a look Ooh. around the back. It's all Studio oh, like Hub that. inputs and outputts. So, mm -hmm. yep, easy to, easy to install. Uh, Built-in power supply. It doesn't have a wall ward or a line lump or anything like that. You can see the microphones come in on XLR connectors. Uh, it is, it's got phantom power built in, which is also mm. something that you don't generally see in, uh, in products in this price class. Uh, so if you happen to have condensers, it's ready to go. And if you go to the next slide, uh, I'll talk about the meters a little bit. It's got dedicated meters, one for program, the other one for audition. The audition meter is switchable. So if you wanted to follow the uh, the preview or cue buttons, then every time you select something in cue, it'll come up on the meter instead. Uh, it has uh, a studio monitor feed so that you can uh, 
or actually studio guest headphone feed more specifically, but you can send your guest program or audition or an external uh, audio source, or you can even t talk back from the console to your, uh, to your guests. And that plugs into a, a Studio Hub connector in the back. It's got the Q output or preview. And uh, so that could go to a, an external speaker if you like, but it could also feed your, your control room monitors, which mute when the microphones are on, uh, or it could feed your headphones if you like that. It even has split headphone operations. So you could get uh, program in one ear of your headphones and uh, preview in the other ear when it's active. So there's a, there's a lot of functionality here. It does have some logic for the microphones. Uh, it's remote on off cough. So if you want to give people a cough button, for example, you can, you can do that, your guests. Hmm. Uh, and then it's got uh, remote, uh, remote channel start. And, uh, and then it's also got a start pulse that, uh, that gets sent out every time you turn a channel on. So you're able to interact, have the console faders interact with the source equipment a little bit. And uh, I mean, I could, I could go on about this for, you know, another 15 <laughs> minutes easily, but, uh, you know, trying to go quick and, I, you know, give you the, give you the 30,000 foot view. Well, that, then that's kind of what, what websites are for too. I understand that you'll be shipping this pretty soon this summer sometime. Summer. That's right. Yeah. Is that right? Summertime. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. Hey, so you know uh, what I'll be doing between now and summer. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, hey, we, we're going to take a one one last break real quick and then get a final uh, thought, a final word from Mike Dosh, uh, proprietor, founder of Angry Audio. And we'll be right back after this from Broadcast Bionics. Camera One from Broadcast Bionics. Designed to bring video to your audio content. Visualizing radio and podcasts for social media. Camera One can automatically create, capture, and brand professionally switched video for live streaming or upload, making your production shareable. Control and configure using a web browser on any device. Camera One is available as a 4-camera or 8-camera system using the Blackmagic A10 Mini range, including the A10 Mini Extreme. You can use cameras to suit your studio and your budget. You'll need one camera for a studio wide shot and usually one camera per microphone. A standard multi-channel sound card or IP driver monitors audio from each studio microphone and we work natively with Axia systems. Ideally, this will be a post-fader feed from each mic, although you can use pre-fade audio or a mic split if that's all you have available. These audio levels are used to intelligently switch the video feed when each contributor is talking. You can also group microphones together into one shot and use the audio from a mixer's aux bus. You can use Camera One's auto switch feature or disable it and switch using the on-screen buttons or the buttons on the ATEM. Recordings can automatically start when you tell the system you're on the air. This on-air indication can be linked to your studio's red lights via IP or an Avantech Adam GPIO interface. You can quickly browse all the videos that have been automatically created during your broadcast, download them and post. Camera One is a user installable system. You'll need a good spec Windows 10 PC, i7 with plenty of storage and 16 gig of RAM. It's better if this machine isn't used for anything else. Remember, you can control the software in a web browser on another device on your network. Camera One, a thrifty way of creating scroll stopping video from your show or podcast from Broadcast Bionics. Really awesome stuff from Broadcast Bionics, full of great ideas. They are in charge of technology. They're right up front with it. And Dan McQuillan, the founder of Broadcast Bionics, will be our guest coming up in a few weeks. I know I've been saying that for a while, but he will be, really. I saw him at NAB, and he'll be explaining the virtual rack system to us. That's going to be pretty cool. All right, our final few seconds with Mike Dosh. Mike, what would you like to leave uh, our viewers and listeners uh, with uh, as a thought? I was just going to tell him to tune in to watch Dan McQuillan, one of my very favorite people of all time. So uh, he's he's a genius. He's he's incredible. Yep, he sure, I got he nothing. Sure is. I got nothing else. I'm all. <laughs> I'm, I've told you everything I need to tell you, so I'm finished. Uh, well, the website's angryaudio.com. Uh, Mike, you've been designing consoles uh, for years and years, and thank you for uh, sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us here today. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, Kirk. All right, Mike Dosh with Angry Audio. He, he's literally down the street from me, so it's it's. it's uh, I've spent more time with him here. Well, not nah, had uh, we, we had a nice chat a few 
few weeks ago. Okay, we got to run. Uh, thanks to Chris Tarr for joining us from Racine, Wisconsin. Thanks to Mike Dosh for uh, uh, being our guest on short notice today. And coming up next week on This Week in Radio Tech, hey, I should, I, you know, I really should have been a little bit better prepared for this. Oh, yeah, we're going to be on the road in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, this time next week, I'm doing a series of SBE meetings on the West Coast, Seattle, uh, Portland, Medford, and Eugene, Oregon. So we're going to wrestle up some en- engineers and bring them on the show against their will and, and bring them to you. So we're going to have a good time with uh, engineers in Eugene, Oregon. So we'll see you with that next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>